Uh, welcome to the IHPI seminar series. Um, just a couple of announcements before we get started. Um, this is our last seminar before for, uh, for the summer, but we do have uh, one summer talk that is going to be at a similar time slot and that you guys might be interested in, which is um, uh, some discussion of current things going on in Washington and healthcare policy by Jonathan Cohen um, that will be here in this auditorium on July, is it July 19th? Kara? Yes. July 19th. Um, so keep that on your calendars. Um, and uh, there will be some snacks in the lobby after the talk. So if you want to stay around and have some informal conversations with your peers, um, there, there, there will be some snacks out there. So don't run off too quickly. Um, so for today, we have uh, our guest speaker is Dr. Mashida Beer. Uh, and Dr. Abir is an emergency room physician and a health services researcher who's been with IHPI for uh, many years. <laughs> and she has a joint appointment with the University of Michigan and RAND. She's the director of a center called the Acute Care Research Unit here at the University of Michigan. And um, she's had research in a lot of different areas. Um, she's uh, done some studies on the interaction between emergency room services and um, inpatient work, ambulatory care, mostly focused on how to make those connections work better and provide better outcomes uh, for patients. Um, today, she's going to be talking to us about a really fascinating project that involves connecting a whole bunch of different stakeholders and data around the opioid crisis. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Obier. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I appreciate everyone being here on a really beautiful sunny day where you could be outside, uh, you know, um, enjoying the good weather. Um, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to present the System for Opiate Overdose Surveillance, uh, SOS. And uh, this is a project that is funded by uh, the CDC uh, uh, Injury Center here at the University of Michigan and by the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas and by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So um, as Caroline mentioned, I'm an ER doc and um, we are on the front line of everything. We're the safety net. And uh, I've been practicing for 10 years now, and uh, prior to that, that, four years of residency, and I've practiced in various places uh, across the United States, the Northeast, Midwest, the South, and academia, community, hospitals, academic affiliates. And what I can tell you for sure is that the opioid cri crisis does not spare anyone. Doesn't matter what you look like, where you come from, how old you are, what you have in your bank account. So it does not discriminate in that way. And uh, you know, for me and my colleagues in the emergency department, it's very personal, okay? So we deal with people who come in half dead or completely dead, and some of them we save, some we don't save. And I'll share a couple of stories from my own experience recently. Um, so a couple of months ago on a Sunday morning, around nine in the morning, I had a shift at the adult ER here at Michigan Medicine. And suddenly we get two critical patients from the parking lot two young adults, a male and a female. And the respiration rates for both was in the single digits. And they had shot up some kind of opioid in the car with the hopes of being found in the ER parking lot so they could get saved if they used too much of the opioid. So in that situation, we happened to save both of them and many others we don't. And uh, also, it's getting scarier. So the kind of things that we're say, seeing right now is, for example, you know, Narcan, which is the anecdote for opiate overdose, is also being abused. So on, on one shift, uh, we had three kids come in, and I use kids because now I'm in my 40s, so I can do that, young adults, um, who uh, chief complaint was Narcan party. So if you can imagine what is Narcan party, literally that was the chief complaint. You can't make this stuff up. So apparently they were all at a party in Ann Arbor, and they had Narcan, and there was a designated Narcan shooter, okay, like a designated driver, so that if the others at the party overdosed, that the person could administer Narcan and save the people. That's scary. 
And the, the other scary part is that a lot of people don't know, depending on how much opioid you use, that one dose of Narcan is not going to last that long. So that it's not going to save you ultimately if you don't have enough backup Narcan. So a pretty, pretty scary kind of like outlook here. And you know, in the ER, we usually deal with the tip of the iceberg no matter what the condition is. I mean, we see a lot of kind of, you know, you know, smaller things like toe jam and my hair hurts, whatever. But we see a lot of things, the extremes of disease, right? So opioid overdose is the extreme of the opioid abuse disease. And, and, and that is, again, something that I gravitated to understanding uh, out of my own personal experience as an ER doc. So how big is the problem? So as I was making this PowerPoint, you know, I was sitting with my eight-year-old son, and he was really interested in this particular one, and he was describing to me that, Mom, the one on the red looks like a really, really bad problem. Yes, it is a very bad problem, this opioid crisis. But we really don't know how big it is. We know it's really big. We really don't know how big it is. And why is that? Because we don't have ways to do surveillance of fatal and non-fatal overdoses in a timely manner. So, for example, in Michigan, you know, how bad is the problem? You know, where are the hotspots? Which communities are in most trouble? And this is information that's really, really important. Why? Because as much as the federal government and many other entities are throwing money to understand and address the opioid crisis, there's not enough money to go around, right? So understanding which communities are in most, most trouble so that you can target both public health and law enforcement interventions is absolutely critical. So what is the current state of opioid surveillance in the country? Uh, it's, it's in really kind of bad shape. So for the most part, a lot of individual counties or health departments, and this is not just in Michigan, this is in many other places, they're doing kind of one-off surveillance. They're doing their own thing. And, and when you do your own thing, your system doesn't talk to the other systems in your state or to other states, and it's not scalable, and a lot of times it's not sustainable. So doing one-off kind of initiatives is probably not the long-term solution. Also using outdated or manually collected information. Okay, so when you look at a lot of the, you know, talks that folks in Michigan do and talking about the crisis in Michigan, you will notice that a lot of the data is from 2016. And you're lucky if you see any data more recent than that. So if we assume that this is a static epidemic and that both geographically and its size, it's not changing, then yes, relying on data from 2016 may not be a bad approach. But we need to really understand what this epidemic is doing, how it's moving you know, between communities across the state and across the United States. And in order to do that, we need real-time or near real-time surveillance. Another approach that people are taking is syndromic surveillance. And I'm sure there's a lot of public health folks in this audience today. And you all know what this is. So essentially, it's a chief complaint-driven surveillance system. So that you, based on, for example, ER visits and chief complaints when people go to the ER visits, you have, you track to understand, you know, uh, whether there's an epidemic coming up, for example, for influenza. So what is the problem with that? As many of you may know, a chief complaint is when someone goes to either a doctor's office or an ER or urgent care, and they express to the person who's registering them in, why am I here today? And in the case of the ER, a lot of times it's the nurse's opinion or the patient is not even responsive and it's the team decide, you know, well, patient is here for unresponsiveness and they assign a chief complaint. That is not the final diagnosis of the patient. So because there's no medical workup that's been done. It's purely an impression, an initial impression, imprecise. And so, for example, the state has a surveillance system that's based on syndromic surveillance, which, again, many places use, not to put it down. However, again, it's chief complaint driven, and according to the state, they have never been able to foresee an upcoming epidemic, ever. And it's been around for years. So, so that tells you that you know, it's probably not the best approach. And, and when I talk about you know, chief complaint, it's compared to an ICD-10 code. So the ICD-10 code, which used to be an ICD-9 code until recently, is, is the actual diagnosis that after the clinical workup has been done, what is the diagnosis of that patient? 
that is a lot more accurate because at that point, so for example, in the case of overdose, you have a history, EMS or the ambulance tells you that there was a needle in the person's arm. You know, you have a urine drug screen. You may have other information that helps you decide whether or not the person had an opioid overdose. Another approach people are taking is, is taking counts of opioid overdoses by counting Narcan administration, either by police or by ambulances or EMS agencies. Uh, and, you know, again, there, you know, for just and a lot of you may already know this, but Narcan is, is a pretty harmless medication uh, that is meant to reverse an opioid overdose. Now, when EMS or police find an unresponsive patient or person in the field, they, especially given the current epidemic, they go ahead and give them Narcan as they should. However, you know, if someone had, you know, uh, passed out from a cardiac reason or a lung reason or they had a stroke or a bleed in their brain or a completely different reason unrelated to opioid overdose, they will be counted in. And that's a problem. So that is also inaccurate. And, you know, talking about Narcan and using that for surveillance, um, there is a system uh, that some folks across the country are using, particularly in the Northeast, called ODMAP. And ODMAP is a, 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 a very clever system. It maps geocodes where overdoses occur, and it relies on a couple of pieces of information. So incoming data from police and EMS from the field on individuals with location of suspected overdose. Sometimes they suspect overdose, again, if there's a needle in the person's arm, or there's drugs on the scene, or there's family or friends who say that, yeah, the person was shooting up heroin. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's based on Narcan administration. So again, Narcan administration, any unresponsive or poorly responsive individual should get Narcan. Some people do, do come out of, uh, even if it's an overdose, sometimes it reverses it, sometimes it requires multiple doses. But if you're counting all the ones that didn't respond as, as overdoses, then you're overcounting opioid overdose in cases where they actually weren't. So what kind of challenges do we have here in Michigan for, for kind of getting an idea of, of how big the opioid uh, problem is and doing surveillance? Just like many other states, uh, medical examiner data in Michigan is not centralized. So there's not one place or one entity that actually all medical examiners across the state report their deaths to. Imagine if we had that system, then we could keep track of all the overdoses uh, that lead to death. And we'd be in one place and we could all understand the scope of the problem, uh, you know, as far as opioid deaths are concerned. Emergency department data also is not centralized. There are a couple of, of uh, health information exchanges across the state. There are two bigger ones uh, that have data for most of the states. So one is uh, Great Lakes Health Connect, which I'll talk about in a minute. And they have data for almost all of the lower peninsula except for uh, a couple of health systems and hospitals. And they don't have any of the upper peninsula. And there's My Hand, which is another uh, health information exchange that uh, the, the state Michigan Department of Health and Human Services uses. So, but in that situation even, it's not all of the states, it's not all of the emergency departments, and, and currently not being used for the purposes of keeping track of overdoses. Then there is uh, emergency medical services, Narcan administration. There is a centralized EMS database uh, that Michigan Department of Health and Human Services keeps called MyEMSIS. And in MyEMSIS, uh, every one to three days you get data refreshed on Narcan administration for the entire state. So that's pretty comprehensive, but again, it's just Narcan administration and many people who are not overdoses, uh, who, who are unresponsive or poorly responsive do get Narcan. So, so I wanna briefly talk about this recent data. We actually actually crunched these numbers last week. Uh, this piece of the project is funded by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And the purpose of, of this piece of the project was to look uh, in Washtenaw County to see how, what is the positive predictive value and sensitivity of Narcan administration uh, for detecting opioid overdoses. So uh, we used uh, 2017 data for Michigan Medicine, so our own emergency department, and all transports to our ED by Huron uh, uh, Valley Ambulance, which is the main ambulance agency in Washtenaw County. And uh, this is 2017 data, and we measured the positive predictive value of naloxone administration as an indicator of opioid overdose. 
So we had 145 cases of uh, naloxone transports to Michigan Medicine by HVA. Of those, 59 cases received an ICD-10 code of opioid overdose. So the positive predictive value is 0.41. Number two, we measured the sensitivity of naloxone administration as an indicator of opioid overdose. So 108 Michigan cases uh, with an opioid overdose-related ICD-10 code were transported to the ED by HVA. Of those, 58 cases received naloxone from HVA. So the sensitivity of naloxone administration for picking up cases of overdose is 0.54. So, you know, given that this is a small sample, it's not that big of a sample, we're waiting on data for St. Joe's Emergency Department, which is the other main ED in Washtenaw County, and we'll have a larger sample. But at least based on this data, you know, to, to make a case that you should use Narcan administration alone as, an, as a way to detect overdoses is probably not a very good idea. So we sought with the funding sources that I described earlier to form a partnership between the University of Michigan Injury Prevention Center and HIDA, High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, uh, in order to come up with a public health law enforcement partnership to understand the best approach to surveillance for opioid overdoses, both fatal and non-fatal in the state of Michigan. And the funds that are coming from the high intensity drug trafficking areas are from the Office of National Drug Control Pol Policy. So what are these high intensity drug trafficking areas? So as the name implies, there are counties in states across the United States where drugs are dealt the most, they're bought and sold the most. And HIDA is a coalition of state, local state and federal law enforcement that, that have joined forces to address the opioid crisis in designated geographic areas across the United States. So all states across the United States have HIDA counties, and the mission is to assist law enforcement disrupt and dismantle drug trafficking organization and money laundering organizations. It is a program of the federal government. So, um, you know, these are cops, essentially, that we're partnering with. And I will tell you that, that this complement of public health and law enforcement is incredibly powerful. Because, you know, as uh, Amanda Kagowski is sitting right here, who is the manager of the acute care research unit, which I run, and she's the public health analyst. So she's the glue between the cops and, and, and the doctors and the, the public health experts. As she will tell you, when we have sat across the table with our, our cop partners, there has been so many aha moments because we don't have their perspective and they don't have ours. And when the two, two sides come together, there are solutions that come apparent that you know, each group alone cannot come up with. So it's incredibly powerful and it's been a really positive experience for our team. So HIDA is all about interagency collaboration. It was established by Congress in 1988, and it supports criminal intelligence sharing and interagency collaboration. In 2015, five HIDAs came together to create the heroin response strategy in response to the opioid crisis. And the main principle behind the HRS is that you need to have a partnership between public health and law enforcement in order to come up with the most effective strategies to address this crisis. So um, essentially the goals of the HRS, so the, there are actually 22 HRS participating states across the United States, and the goals are to improve collaboration between public health and public safety, increase the timeliness and quality of overdose reporting, and develop strategies to reduce fatal and non-fatal overdoses. And as part of this, effective surveillance is one of the top missions. So when we got around the table to think about how to approach surveillance in Michigan, and for any, anywhere else for that matter, there were a couple of things that came to mind that were incredibly important. So before I get into these points, I want to talk about you know, some examples of surveillance across the country that are currently recognized as the gold standard. So for example, in Massachusetts, Massachusetts links over a dozen data sets to understand the epidemic, which is great. You know, so they do you know, inpatient data, ED data, uh, data from outpatient providers, from, uh, from rehab centers, uh, prescription practices, a lot of data linked across the way. But 
you know, Massachusetts is a very resource-rich state. Which other state can replicate that model? And the other question as a researcher for me is, what, what do you really seek to understand from linking that many data sets? What actually usable, concrete, actionable information are you gaining from that? So when we sat across the table with our law enforcement partners, one of our main goals was, what are the fewer complement of data sets that will give us the most information? And also, how can we design a system that could be scaled and also apply not just here in Michigan, but elsewhere and serve a model for the country? So that was the initial intent when we started doing this work. Also, we wanted to understand how we can identify the hotspots. So yeah, the problem is big across the board, and I think everyone understands that to some degree, but where are the problems the worst? Which communities need the help the most? And where do we need to get to first? So that's how you maximize limited resources, and that was part of the goal of the system that we, were, we set out to design. Also, it had to be timely and accurate. So again, data from 2016 is not going to inform law enforcement. So if there's suddenly a cluster of opioid overdose dose deaths in a certain neighborhood in Michigan, if, if, law, if this happened two years ago, there's nothing you can do about it now. It may not be the case anymore. But if they know it happened yesterday and they know today where those hotspots are, maybe you can do something about it. Same, same thing with, with public health. So if you know where the trouble areas are, and this is at the population level, it's not at the individual level, you can target your interventions to those communities that need it the most. Again, both law enforcement and public health. So um, we started off uh, in year one, which was the first phase of the project, in Washtenaw County to test our idea of how we can come up with the scalable, timely system. So we basically chose three data sets. We wanted to keep it simple, three data sets. So one was EMS data or ambulance agency data. Uh, so that is information on all individuals who were transported to Michigan Medicine who were administered Narcan by ambulances. So that's the EMS piece. Then there's emergency department data. So Michigan Medicine data and St. Joe's data is coming and we'll have the whole, whole, whole uh, Washtenaw County ED data. But for anyone be able to pick up anyone who was seen in the, any of these EDs who was either admitted or discharged with an ICD-10 code related to opioid overdose. And also medical examiner data from Washtenaw County. So imagine if someone overdoses and an ambulance picks them up on the street or at their home and administered Narcan and will get captured in the EMS data. When they get transported to the emergency department and they get either admitted or discharged, if they're alive, it, get ca it gets captured there. And that's a confirmation or validation step that that Narcan that was administered by EMS actually occurred in a person who actually had an overdose or didn't. And lastly, if that person did not make their ED visit, they died, they end up on the medical examiner's table, then you also see that there. So you have visibility, you can track the same individual from the time they overdosed on the street to the time they were dead in the medical examiner's office, right through, without overcounting or undercounting. In a lot of states where they're looking at similar data, they are not linking these data sets. They're looking at them separately. So the same individual that would show up in each of the data sets would be counted three times. And you would have no idea that that's redundant because you're not linking the data. What we're doing is that we're using these all three data sets, the EMS, ED, and medical examiner data in a fully identified way. So we have patient identifiers and we can link the three data sets through probabilistic matching to remove the redundancy and be able to track the same individual across the three settings. And so once we identify these folks, we update SOS. And um, the, the data sources that we get uh, from each of them are essentially very compact. We're not wanting any other information but to identify fatal and not fatal overdoses and geocode them. So we want to know, you know, ideally two pieces of information for all overdoses where it occurred and where does a patient live. And sometimes those two locations are the same and sometimes they're not, but that's the information we want because we want to hotspot the areas that are, have, have the biggest problems with overdose. That's the goal. So to accomplish that, we've kept the list of variables that we're asking from each of these data sets pretty compact. So we have a person's name, the date of the overdose, date of birth, incident and or home address, outcome of the overdose, whether it's fatal or non-fatal, race, gender. And from the EMS data set, we're going to 
know that they, they were administered Narcan. From the ED data set, we're also going to know their ICD-10 code, so their final diagnosis. And we're going to have a urine drug screen. And from the ME data for the deaths that occur, within four to eight weeks, depending on the medical examiner, we're going to actually get the toxic toxicology report. So we're going to know the offending agent or agents that resulted in the, in the fatal overdose. So this is the data that we have. So this is for 2017. So again, this is the pilot from phase one. And uh, you know, just to give you some sense of the total numbers, uh, the total non-fatal overdose is 147, and the total fatal is 71. And uh, across the board, you have uh, more males than females and uh, more white individuals. And the peak of overdose uh, for uh, the non-fatal is, is in the 25 to 34 year old range. But you know, clearly we're gonna have access in the system to some of this demographic information. Uh, but again, the biggest goal here is geocoding and understanding where these are occurring. So this is uh, data from January 1st, 2017 to December 31st, 2017. And what this is representing is the EMS data, the ED data, and medical examiner data were again linked and all the redundancies were removed. And this is actually showing you two things for all the non-fatal locations. The orange is the residence location and the green is the incident location. And based on this data for that full year, we identified the hotspot zip codes, so the, 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 and they're the ones that were listed. We have a similar map uh, so for the fatal overdose locations. So the red dots are the incident location, the blue ones are the resident location, and the hotspot zip codes were identified for the overdose deaths here. And in case you're wondering, uh, about 40 some odd percent of the time, the location of the overdose and the home location overlap. And our law enforcement partners tell us that they're not surprised by that because the majority of the time, the place where the drug is bought, the person usually uses it within the mi a mile of where they buy the drug. So they weren't surprised by seeing the numbers that we came up with. And we have some very recent uh, uh, data to share with you from last week. Again, importance of having timely data. So this is uh, uh, for ED data and uh, EMS data linked again. And uh, you see the non-fatal uh, 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 overdoses in this map uh, that have uh, show the hotspots and some demographic information. So, you know, I can stop for some questions here uh, before I go on. Go ahead. That hotspot map doesn't take into account uh, the population in each of the count of the zip code areas. How would you deal with that? Uh, so we haven't dealt with that yet, but the system itself is going to be projecting the rates, and it's going to, once it's actually up and running, will we'll be based on the, pop, the rate of the population, so that you're not, for example, on the Upper Peninsula, where the, there's that, it's not populated, you're, not, you're comparing apples with apples at the end of the day. So the data that I showed does not account for that, but ultimately the system will. It probably is at this point. The data that I reflected, because it's not, um, it's the population rate is not really accounted for. Are there any uh, among the ED patients mm -hmm. who got naloxone did not have a ICD-10 diagnosis of opioid overdose? Are there any patterns among that group in terms of is there a systematic way for undercounting these? Because it seems like your non-fatals are kind of undercounted, and I can imagine a variety of reasons why. Were there, and also similarly, were there, were there uniformity around drug testing? We haven't looked at those things yet. So this is the, the project, the validation step just started uh, about a month and a half ago, and this was the first analysis that came out of it. So what the state has asked us to do is actually look at some of what you just alluded to, which is uh, looking at gender and race and age and kind of trying to figure out if there are patterns where we can actually understand uh, why we're undercounting. I mean, to explain exactly what we're seeing. We haven't done that yet. And open to talking to you about uh, what else we should potentially be looking at. I yep. Take most of those ones that have discharged after being down cyanotic 
and reverse with naloxone, and those are all opioid overdoses. And the same thing, similarly in EMS, I don't know how big the population is, but there are several studies on what people who use EMS, and my guess is, again, the ones who are found apneic who get naloxone, wake up and refuse transportation, are probably all uh, reasonably from those opioid overdoses. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, so I think at the end of the day, um, uh, you're, you're pointing at the ED setting. I think that the EMS and, and ED data sets are going to have a lot of problems. Uh, we're also going to be missing a bunch of people. So if someone goes to an urgent care, it's not captured here. If they go from the scene, they refuse transport by EMS, that's not going to get, because uh, you have to get transported for that to even count, right? So. So I think that at the end of the day, once this is up and running, there's going to be many kind of disclaimers of what this is exactly, what it isn't. And it is not perfect. But I think really early on, we made a decision that we weren't going to let perfect be the enemy of the good. And I think that this is something is like a Lego block mentality of building pieces one by one and making it better over time. And Caroline, going back to your question earlier, I just want to add something that um, the purpose of, of the data that I'm presenting and, and, and the talk overall is more so how we built it. The data that we're presenting is, is very much a, a pilot and, and, and you know, so it's not so much for the intention of, of pinpointing the location so much, but the pilot test kind of goal is to test whether this probabilistic matching and the entire process is doable or not. Um, and there's a lot of uh, kinks and glitches that we need to think through and, and, and kind of fix uh, before it, it's kind of ready for prime time and, and kind of sharing the actual data. Um, I'm going to speak by the sensitivity of uh, the initial data of the naloxone administration that was so low. And I'm curious if you could speak to that, like what the implications of that are for surveillance and just for treatment in general, if it's the same thing to give, and is it just that people aren't that sick and they don't really need it, or, or how, is, how is overdose defined here? Like, I would think that they would need it if they are for overdose. That, that, that's an excellent question. So, um, you know, we, Amanda and I, before we set up to do this analysis, we didn't find that anyone else has done this particular analysis. Now, it may be lurking somewhere out there. I want to put that out there for a second. Um, number two is, based on my own clinical experience, just my own anecdote, um, my guess was that it would actually be closer to 33%. And, you know, I, would, I thought it would be even more dismal than that. Because I think in the ER, at least, when I give Narcan to my patients who are poorly responsive or unresponsive, I'm lucky if a third of the time uh, they come about. So, you know, so we'll see what the St. Joe's data says. But going back to your question, of, of what, does this, what is the implication for all of this. When we shared this data actually yesterday on a phone call with our law enforcement partners who are a big fan of the OD map that I shared, they love that. Their first reaction was, oh no, so we're giving all these people Narcan and the, or the, should all these people be getting Narcan? And that's when I said, no, 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 that's not the takeaway message here at all. So Narcan is a harmless drug. This is a really, really bad epidemic. People are dying, more, more so than motor vehicle collisions now. So if someone is poorly responsive or unresponsive, they should be given Narcan. However, the take-home message is Narcan administration alone should not be used for surveillance and for counting of overdoses. So that, that you, know, you shouldn't say that, oh, well, you know, in such and such county, uh, you know, last month, you know, 30 patients got Narcan, so that means that there were 30 overdoses. That you can't do because of the numbers, at least based on what I just shared with you, which is, again, preliminary.
Dr. Joyce DeYoung is the medical examiner. You're probably familiar with her yeah. work on the west side of the state. Um, she did really interesting work recently where she started doing talk screens on non-opioid related deaths, things like car accidents, and yep. found the presence of opioids in a lot of those patients. So, which, which kind of led her to believe the opioid endemic, especially fatal, is, is a lot more impactful than we have numbers for. Does your research have a way to kind of capture that yet, or is that part of kind of the future iteration of this? Sure, absolutely. So I actually was on a call with her this week, and we were talking about uh, synergy potentially between the two projects. and. Uh, you know, the way I understand her project is, let's say even there's someone in a motor vehicle collision who's even a, a passenger, who's not even the driver, and, you know, doing talk screens on people who are in fatal crashes. And, you know, the, you know I think that it, it is more an indication of, of abuse. It doesn't necessarily, you know, tell you that there wasn't an overdose, but there's no way you can prove an overdose, um, you know, just solely based on a positive uh, drug screen for someone detecting uh, you know, opioid in their system when they are found dead, you know, in a car crash or in, an, in, in a different setting. Uh, so I think that it's more, it's a more accurate um, count of, of the op abuse problem. And I don't know in, in that situation whether you, how you would go about uh, determining if it was truly an overdose or not. And, uh, you know, I think that um, for me, it is so important and has been that to look at this crisis as a spectrum and that overdose truly is at the extreme. And I think that it requires kind of a, a focus and an attention all by itself. Now, you know, it, it can be a sign of someone who is, um, you know, if, especially if it's a non-fatal overdose, which is probably more interesting to know about because you can potentially do something about and intervene on than fatal ones. Um, you really wanna, uh, y there's a difference between someone who maybe it was at a party, a young person who usually doesn't use opioids, used opioid once and it ended up dead, not breathing. That's one situation. But then it's someone who has a history of abuse, who, who escalates and end, ends up dead with an overdose. But I think the situation of escalation and death from an opioid overdose is what we were focusing on. And, 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 and you know, I really, uh, and I'll talk about that in a few slides down of how important it is to have a kind of like razor sharp focus on that piece because uh, it really merits attention by itself. So um, this has been a fascinating ride, and and you know I, uh, you know I'm clearly a health services researcher. I've had other projects that have had community engagement, stakeholder engagement, uh, you know obstacles. Um, but but I think that I have to say that I have never been involved in a project that has had this many turns in the road, and this many obstacles. And uh, I say that. Uh, you know, partially kind of with excitement and partially with pain. Uh, but overall, uh, it's been a fascinating uh, learning experience for me and my team and collaborators. Um, so there's a number of issues in this phase two. So phase two is year two, and uh, year two ends uh, in October. And there is going from one county, which was the pilot, to envisioning a, a, a real-time surveillance system for fatal and non-fatal overdoses for the whole state is quite a task. And uh, since uh, you know, uh, none of us on our team had designed a surveillance system before, uh, there was a lot of, of learning as you go. And for starters, I want to say that apparently you can't just go off and do surveillance on the population. <laughs> you can't just one day pick up and decide to do that. You have to have authority to do that by the state or federal government so, uh, entity. So um, that's one part of it. There is legal issues. There is compliance IRB issues, stakeholder funding issues. So, so this overall has just been a fascinating exercise in, in what has turned out to be not really a research project but a public health initiative. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the steps in the expansion process was identifying the key stakeholders. Uh, so I talked about EMS data, so in the pilot uh, we got the data from HVA. This is local, they send us the data every one to three days we get data from them on, on Narcan administration for transports uh, to our emergency department. So we had that, but, but we need to talk to someone who actually has uh, data for the whole state, right? Because it has to be the whole state system. Also for the ED piece, you know, we have Michigan Medicine data, we have access to it every day, we have IRB approval to do research on it and look at it in every which way. We're getting St. Joe's data, we have that, but again, how do you go from that 
to getting ED data for all of the state and also in near real time. So you need to get that in a timely way. And same thing with the medical examiner data, right? So again, we established a relationship for the pilot with the uh, medical examiner in Washtenaw County, but, but that is a long way from getting medical examiner data in a timely way in a state where there is no centralized system. So lots of challenges there. Uh, so we found out what our needs were. We found out who in the state may have some of the solutions, and we met with the leadership of those groups. And we established some common ground to see how we can move forward in phase two uh, with some mutually beneficial goals so that all parties are getting something good out of this. So that was kind of the goal for stakeholder engagement. Um, so, and these are the partners that we actually came up with. Um, so the goal for phase two is to expand uh, SOS from Washtenaw County, which is one of the 12 Haida counties in Michigan, to, to an additional three to five. So that's the goal by October 2018. And we partnered with a group called MDI Log, which is an online medical examiner data collecting system and reporting system. And you may wonder, why didn't I mention that earlier? So if you can believe this, um, after multiple conversations with the Washtenaw County Medical Examiner, which is our partner, and we work closely with them, after a few meetings, we found out that they actually run this system. So that wasn't apparent in the beginning, and, and this online reporting system reports on about 50% of the counties across the state. It's not for the whole, whole state, but 50% of the counties. And from the time a dead body is delivered, to a medical examiner's with the office within three to five hours, data on a suspected overdose is reported in the system. How awesome is that, right? It's not the whole state, but it's a lot of the state. And um, essentially, you know, when the dead body gets in, they can tell usually if it's a, sus a suspected overdose. There's drug paraphernalia, or there's drug on the scene, or there's family or someone, and when the report is completed that's submitted to the medical examiner, they usually have some data pointing to the fact that this is an overdose. And then depending on the medical examiner's office, within uh, you know, four to eight weeks, they have the confirmation on the toxicology report. So this ended up being our death data partner. Uh, and we, develop, we basically set up a, a subcontract with them to get the data. Uh, and then partnership with Great Lakes Health Connect, which as I mentioned earlier, is one of the health information exchanges in the state. And they have real-time data every time someone is admitted to the hospital or discharged from an emergency department with an, with an ICD-10 code that's related to an opioid overdose. This data will come to us for the hospitals that are willing to participate in SOS within three to five hours. Okay, Again, it doesn't get more real-time than that. So that's our ED partner. The problem with this system is that they have none of the Upper Peninsula and they have almost all of the peninsula, or lower peninsula with a few exceptions. And as you know, the rural areas have a big opioid problem. So we need to somehow get that data over time through agreements and come up with a solution of how to get the upper peninsula. But as of yet, you know, that's not something that we can get through Great Lakes. And also through prior relationships with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, uh, they gave us the initial green light for getting data from them for the whole state on Narcan administration for upper and lower peninsula for all ambulance transports that administer Narcan. And our IRB, uh, once we got the IRB, which I'll get into in a second here, from Michigan Medicine, so which was, um, does not, uh, is not regulated, once we had that, we were able to proceed with the IRB application for the state and, and application to get their data. And that is going through. It's in progress right now. They pre preemptively told us we will be getting the data eventually in the next couple of months so that, you know, that's, that's a huge piece of this three data set puzzle that, again, will be linked through probabilistic matching and ultimately on the SOS website, which I'll show you a, a, a preliminary prototype of, will be mapped and geocoded so that we know where the hotspots are and refreshed every one to three days. So um, I've mentioned the capabilities so far, but I'll kind of go through them again a little bit here. Uh, so SOS will be updated um, for most of the data every 24 hours. And for the death data, uh, you know, again, initially it's going to be suspected overdoses, an event uh, which is going to be reflected on the map in a certain color. And once the confirmation comes, the color changes to a confirmed overdose. And we're going to have the toxicology report of you know, what the offending agent or agents are, which is huge for law enforcement so that they know exactly what drugs are on the street and what, what drugs are killing people. 
Um, and then, uh, so as I mentioned, one of the most powerful aspects of this approach is, is uh, you know, eliminating over and undercounting. Uh, so that, again, a lot of places are using similar databases, but they're not linking them uh, so that individually, when you look at them, you don't know how much, where the re redundancy is and how, where you're overcounting the uh, overdoses. Uh, uh, the system will present both rates and raw numbers of events. So again, the, the data that I showed you is just raw numbers um, uh, uh, and not the rates, but the system itself will, will show the data in both ways. We'll have a view that's rate and view that's uh, or raw numbers. Um, We'll provide both uh, location of home and location of death for fatal overdoses and non-fatal EMS um, and allows for uh, tracking the movement of the epidemic across communities in the state. Um, the county level data will be open to the public. So imagine you log on to this SOS website. Uh, anyone can see the map at the county level. But for everyone else, which are the key stakeholders who provided the data for the system and others who need to know this data, it's going to be password protected. And you will go in and you'll be able to see the data, the overdoses at the census track level. Now, from a legal perspective, um, uh, we would have been able to actually give access to the public to the census track data. And what we would have done is that within the same census tract, the dot of where the location of the overdose was or the home location was wouldn't have to be the exact place, but a randomly located dot within that same census tract. But we really didn't feel that although legally and from an IRB perspective, we didn't need to be this careful, we didn't feel like anyone needs to know that information outside of people who have to do something about it. So we, we, you know, we want to protect you know, this data and be, be kind of very, very careful with it. So we are not going to, the average person is not going to have access to the census tract level data. Um, so regulatory, uh, regulatory review, so this was quite a process. Um, so again, we had IRB approval for the county, of Washtenaw County, and for that, it was a research project. So we were able to do number crunching and ask all sorts of questions from the data. But we were now moving to uh, the larger kind of uh, the statewide system vision. And to do that, there was an obstacle. And the obstacle was that to use Great Lakes Health Connect data, so that's the ED data, we would not be allowed to use it for research. Big problem, right? So, so that we could use it for surveillance, but we cannot use it for research. So we had to somehow make a case to the IRB here at Michigan Medicine that this is surveillance, that, that yes, the Washtenaw County one was a research thing. We were pilot testing it. Now we're moving on to bigger things. And this is now surveillance and not research. And then we had to learn a lot about the differences. Um, and this is fascinating to me, and hopefully you'll find it interesting. So public health surveillance can be classified into, again, research or non-research. And uh, when, when it's research, it's meant to produce generalizable knowledge. When it's non-research, it monitors the population for frequency of occurrence of, of a health condition. If it's researched, it may be used to invoke public health prevention or disease injury control, but is not the primary goal is not informing public health. For non-research, um, invokes public health mechanisms to prevent or control disease or injury. And if it's research, the primary intent, intent is usually producing generalizable knowledge. And for non-research, the primary intent is produce information about the population. And in, in, a, in the research aspect of surveillance, again, the scope of the inquiry is broader than assessing occurrence of disease or injury. And non-research is not hypothesis testing. So again, it's tracking a certain disease or condition among the population and not generalizable. So we had to do a lot of homework uh, in meetings with the IRB and understanding this so that we can make a case, you know, having the obstacle again of not being able to use one of the main data sources out of the three, the ED data for research. So we couldn't do that. So we had to make this a purely surveillance system. And we had to make a case that it's not just public health surveillance, it's non-research public health surveillance. So this is kind of a summary of what we went through. So first and foremost, we met with the Office of the General Counsel uh, to understand the legal hazards ahead. So for me personally, there's nothing in life that I'm more afraid of, of the category of knowledge that I don't know I don't, don't know. You know, when you don't know, you don't know something, that's kind of dangerous. So we kind of went in uh, with the general counsel and kind of told them, this is what we want to do. 
tell us everything legally that we want to be aware of and pretend like we don't know anything and really didn't know anything about, about the laws surrounding particularly studying substance abuse in patient populations. I mean, so that's very, there's laws around that uh, that you have to be aware of. So it was really good that that was our starting point. That informed our subsequent meetings with the IRB, Michigan Medicine, of which there was many. And in order to finally get this, this approval of uh, this designation of, of, of not regulated, uh, the CDC Injury Center and Dr. Rebecca Cunningham got a letter from the CDC saying that, yes, indeed, the project that they're trying to do is public health surveillance non-research. And that was like that morning when I got up and saw that letter was like my, ha my birthday. I was, it was incredible. So, um, and that's when we got the designation of not regulated. So, so, you know, it was quite a process, a lot of obstacles, but it was really necessary. And, and, and you know, so, you know, I want to add one thing here is that, you know, I mentioned the three data sources. So obviously the EMS data that we're going to get from the state, the ED data that we're going to get from Great Lakes Health Connect and the medical examiner data. And this project has been amazingly a community and stakeholder-based participatory research project every step of the way, and it will be toward the end, I'm convinced of it. The reason why I say that is although we have you know, a subcontract with Great Lakes Health Connect for them to give us this data from the EDs and hospitals across the state, every hospital that is going to participate is going to have to give an approval for the data that they're giving to Great Lakes Health Connect that will come to us to be used for this purpose. So that's an additional step. And in order to get buy-in from this hospital, we've got buy-in from a number already, but in order to get buy-in kind of like en masse, we actually have a co-sponsored meeting in Lansing next week with Great Lakes Health Connect where all the hospitals that are participating in Great Lakes are hopefully coming, they're invited, they're hopefully coming so we can present this and get buy-in in a larger scale from people. And same thing with the medical examiner data. So MDI log gets data from 50% of the counties across the state. But every medical examiner that gives the data to, to MDI log will have to approve them sharing that data with SOS for this purpose. So we have our work cut out for us. So this is a, 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 you know, a picture of, of the prototype of the website. It's very preliminary. Again, there are many glitches that we have to sort out and, and challenges ahead of us. But preliminarily, we have a website. Uh, so you would log in and you would see this kind of uh, hello, welcome page. And, and ultimately, there would be a map of Michigan. And as we get data from the other counties, this map will be filled in. And if you're a general public person, you go on the website, you can see you know, how many to date you know, um, there's been overdoses, fatal and non fatal in your county. Um, and when you log in, if you have a login and you privilege, you know, you're able to get in, uh, you see it at the census track level, which is, again, very helpful. But even in, in that situation, the exact location of overdose in home for both fatal and non-fatal overdoses is never going to be revealed. Uh, the dot is going to be randomly located somewhere within the census tract. But we believe that this is enough detail uh, for public health and law enforcement interventions at a population level to inform, again, interventions. And, and there would be a heat map view. There's going to be just different views um, of the data presented. And again, refreshed every one to three days. And there's be, going to be some demographics, so you have some idea of the age, uh, gender, and race of individuals who are experiencing these overdoses. So what are the next steps? Um, so our goal is to, as I mentioned, there's 12 uh, Haida counties in Michigan. Uh, of the 12, uh, you know, Washtenaw County is one. Uh, the three to five that we're going to be adding are going to be Haida counties. So we're starting to get a big bag bang for our buck. So we know already these Haida counties are where the drugs are sold most commonly. So we believe that this is the place to start with SOS. Uh, we're adding those counties. Uh, but ultimately, the goal is um, to uh, get a statewide system uh, in three years. And we've already had many conversations uh, with, with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. I presented the project at the Governor's Commission a few weeks ago uh, with the ex explicit intent of, of asking for them to support this as a statewide system. Um, and what kind of implications does it have? So, you know, I think I mentioned that as a researcher, it pains me not to use this, uh, this system for research, right? I mean, it's kind of like, oh my God, it's all here. We should be doing so much more with it. And in time, I believe, you know, I, I think if we started off that way, we would never be able to pull this off. Uh, as it is, there's many challenges ahead. 
Uh, but down the line, I believe once people trust us and they give the data and they see it's working and with the right permissions, that there's a ton you can do. So you can take that from a population level system uh, to individually tracking people. So imagine if you do some kind of uh, uh, you know, a modeling around how many non-fatal overdoses would it take for your next one to be fatal, right? Some predictive modeling around that. And you know, imagine the guy or a woman comes to the ER and you give them a slip that you know, if you continue at this rate, you may die next time. I don't know if IRB would approve that or not, but I'm just saying that uh, you know, there would be kind of individual level implications. And also a lot of the questions I get as well, you know, linking them to prescri pre prescribing data sets and all sorts of other data sets. Uh, uh, down the line, uh, absolutely. But I think that um, keeping this si system simple right now, again, with explicit purpose of identifying fatal and non-fatal overdoses is a heavy, heavy lift in of itself, and if we complicate it, uh, we, may, we may not accomplish the goal. Um, and, uh, uh, and again, implementing interventions for uh, you know, multiple uh, repeat offenders. So there's one person in the data set from 2017 uh, that had, I believe, seven or eight uh, non-fatal overdoses. So you can imagine that the risk of that person dying is really, really high, right? And that's just in our ER. Who knows where else they're going? Uh, so you, know, you can imagine there would be many other uses for this system down the line. Thank you so much. Uh, standardizing and matching the data from the different sources. Can you talk a little bit about that? How you do that? Sure, absolutely. So, um, uh, as I showed in that slide, uh, there's multiple patient identifiers. Uh, so the way that we're going to do the probabilistic matching is that we're going to basically say that if it's the same name and it's the same date of birth and it's the same home address, then it's probably the same person. And uh, that's going to be one of the disclaimers on the website. There's going to be many disclaimers. That's going to be one of it. It's not perfect, uh, but, but it's, it's pretty close. Thank you so much.